Thanks again for tuning in to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio. In this episode, it's still digesting in my mind. There's so much to go off and so much discussed within it, theorised, analysed. When we're talking about the current climate, environmentally, economically, politically, socially, we look at the dynamics between different classes and we really get into revolutionary tactics, how to unite how we need to behave and work with others, both as individuals and organisations. And of course, we go into the contradictions that ultimately is leading to a more radical, progressive option that is revolution towards communism. If you've ever thought about revolution, you're really going to love this. If you are listening, you haven't really read much of Marx, you're also going to pick up a lot of Marx's economic theory. This is one that we're all going to learn a lot of. Extremely grateful to have had Ted Reese on. It's going to be incredible when we bring him back with so much more to talk about. But I know that this is an episode that you are going to love. In other news, you've probably noticed a change in our logo. Our identity has changed and we're so grateful and we have to give a big Thank you and a shout out to Barb Radical who hooked us up with this design along with Strike Poster. Strike Poster is socialist agitprop for the people. It's a design collective building movement media and always anti-fascist. Thank you so much Strike Poster. I love the design. You may or may not know this but Barb also did like Red Menace. Rev left logos etc if you've ever heard the episode with brett where he actually gets the logo he actually gives a description of it and i'm about to do the same goddamn thing i can't believe it i'm like was so hyped i was running around so excited for this logo for a while and then when i finally got it oh my god like even now i'm just so gassed i asked for a logo that could symbolize the struggle of the lumpen proletariat trying to work with other comrades and being ostracized and just the the general nonchalant classist bourgeois from morality people had towards this underclass so you know i said please help us out he got back to me he gave us two logos and here's what he said both options for your logo are essentially an attempt at combining the meh shrug of the lumpen with the hammer and sickle the first option takes a more friendly accessible approach with the target demo of being disaffected zoomers in mind you know thinking that their wants and needs in terms of like what they want to see is ultimately we're trying to you know bring people in and teach them so we can have a goddamn revolution because we need to put an end to capitalism so yeah you may as well share it as well while you're listening they went on to say The second option uses a more European aesthetic, but the general idea is the same. It's a little bit more designy, if that makes sense. So what we have is a logo where it's a mix between a hammer and a sickle and a shrugging, like, person with, like, a little, like, slanted little side face. It's sick. So we love it. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much, Strike Poster. And we really hope that... People out there can appreciate <laughs> this logo a bit more now, knowing you know the the concept behind it, which is so fitting to everything that we have been discussing. Whenever we've done an episode that revolves around the lumpen proletariat, of which there's more to come. So that's nearly it for the introduction. Of course, we're out there on Podbeam now, so you can listen to us on Podbeam. That's just a mobile app. That's one of the easiest ways to listen to us. So download Podbeam, give us a follow, follow us on all your podcast apps anyway, so you get the episodes as soon as they're out and you get notified. Also get an automatic download and then you can listen to it whenever you've got no Wi-Fi or just like recently where the police turn 4G off at like a protest or something. So you can listen to it whenever, uninhibited. Also, if you like what we do here and you want to support us, we are trying to build a movement here. We'll go into that more in future episodes and talk about, you know, the plans behind that. If you are in the UK and you would like to be involved in this, we're talking in real life shit. There's more than that to come. But if you want to support us on all of our work now into the future, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash lumpenpodcast. You get access to 
a certain server in our Discord server, which is linked to in our show notes. And you can also find all of our social media and how to contact us and reach us and follow us and share us in the description. Without further ado, we'll dive into this episode that I'm going to listen to again probably like five times. Here is Ted Reese, author of Socialism or Extinction, Climate, Automation and War in the Final Capitalist Breakdown. The system of capitalism is driving this climate catastrophe. The UK is complicit in Israel's violations of Palestinian human rights for investment in supporting the global arms trade. It's not just a moral stand, it's a political stand. The role that Israel plays securing the interests of US and British imperialism in the Middle East. Some people often kind of talk about Iraq or Afghanistan. Today, where I am, and I like understand these conflicts that have literally been going on since I was born. It's just like horrifying. We had some placards, one of them which said the pretty factual point that Zionism is racism. I personally refuse to learn my parents' language. My brother did it. I'm a bit older than him, so I've gone through 9-11. That was the first time I realized that I look different. Today, much of what passes for leftism is actually quite right-wing, quite destructive. The dictatorship of the proletariat is how the social order in a given country can be steered in a socialist direction. This idea of dialectics is that everything is a web of life, deeply interconnected. The conversation to me is, how do we make all labor less exploitative for women? My writing was first and foremost for disabled people, for outcasts, and for folks on social assistance. The homeowners association mm-hmm. started up because they wanted to exclude certain ethnicities yep. from the suburbs. Fortunately, we've got Ted Reese who's going to come on. He sounds like a typical southern, you know, you're an old governor, one of them. <laughs> I was like quite surprised, to be honest. <laughs> I thought you'd sound like um, David Attenborough or something, to be honest. Um, I'm not messing. I, um, I wish. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I have a voice for print, unfortunately, but there you go. <laughs> Let's just go on so people can actually, including yourself, get to know you a little bit. I'm looking forward to these questions. So can you just tell us a bit about your background before we go into the rest of it? Yeah, well, firstly, thanks very much for having me on. Yeah, I'm Ted Reese. Basically, I've been involved in communist politics for, I suppose it's getting on for close to a decade now. Before that, I was I was um, at university, coming out of university. I did a journalism degree, uh, tried to get into journalism. That didn't work out. Ended up working in uh, publishing and my background is is basically writing and um sort of a lot of it has been sort of summary work uh where you sort of just summarize stuff that's in the news it's it's i don't know if you ever read a book called um flat earth news um i can't remember the author now nick something who wrote for the, the guardian and he came up with this term journalism and um it it felt like I'd become a journalist rather than a journalist because that was the way the industry was going. You know, it's all, it's another sort of symptom of capitalism in decay where industries get stripped out and watered down. Just it all becomes about volume of content. And yeah, so I would become disillusioned with where I was going and got into. Um, I, I mean, I had so so much spare time working in an office that I ended up sort of getting into so-called left Twitter, spending a few hours a day on there. (laughs) And that's really, to be honest, how I got into left-wing politics and communist politics. And then, yeah, I spent the last three or four years writing this book, uh, Socialism or Extinction, just as a... A way of trying to summarise everything I'd learnt, really, in I mean, in the last twelve years. I mean, this is all on the back of the two thousand and eight crisis, um, which is really what I mean. I was politicised before that with the Iraq War, I suppose, but it was it was after two thousand and eight the, with the financial crash that I really started to move uh, more radically to the left. Interesting, the 
it's just bosh that you got a journalism degree. I'd love to do that. But going into the industry and then you realise that you're gonna be <laughs> you're gonna have to conform to be more of a journalist. Is that like yeah. you could say where people are looking for like clickbait and you know, just easy gets clicks, gets views, gets people on the website and they make money off the advertising things, but you didn't really wanna be a journalist. <laughs> no, it's just kind of soul destroying and very tedious. I mean, a lot of the time I wasn't doing anything. <laughs> I mean, that's why I was spending so much time on Twitter. It's like it's 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 kind of like with a lot of people saying now that we need a four hour day or a six hour day or like a four day week mm-hmm. because of the way technology's gone. We don't need to be working eight hours a day anymore it's it's just absurd i'm interested like when you were in that scene like with the other journalists did they have that inner passion within them do you think or they just weren't even considering that journalism should be more or could be more with a kind of capitalist realism mindset I mean, the, the thing is, I, I never really got into journalism in the end. I, I did some freelance football reporting for about four years, but I, I never got, a, in the end, I never got a, a, like a proper job on a paper because when I was going into the industry, it was during, I was looking for my first job at around the time that the financial crash hit or when the, the credit crunch hit um, in 2007 or eight. Most of the people I studied with went into PR at that point. They just sort of, gave up and you know it because it, it, it what well, it happens so often doesn't it like people give up on what they actually want and tr- want to do uh-huh. and try and find a job that will pay what they need to earn to have a decent standard of living so it's difficult to say um i think a lot of people just became disillusioned and took either took what they could get or moved into something else yeah, that's interesting history there of your experience and also the kind of commodification of that sector. And definitely familiar um, with other working sectors as well. That sold a story in place where you think, oh, I've got to just like dive in two feet first now and then just accept that this is what I've won. So do you get into like PR or whatever it is and... You know, yeah. and like in retail, that could be like, oh, fine, I'm going to actually take the supervisor job. I'm going to have to mm. be in store 50 hours a week, five, six days a week, and that's going to be my yeah. goddamn life. But unfortunately, if you want like a half decent legal um, existence, that's what you've got to do. you goddamn a wage slave. Yeah. I mean, people might not even remember, but like originally the news didn't used to be like that. Like, Mm. back in like you know tv as a technology was just coming around and these sort of news stations started popping up like the news used to be a loss leader these um media organizations used to know that they would lose money on doing the news but they did it because it was you know they were supposed to see it as like a a public good essentially um but yeah as you said like with everything you know that exists within capitalism you know nothing can exist anymore without turning a profit for an organization essentially so it became you know um commercialized and corporatized and and that also changes the actual content of what they report and how they report because everything has to be sort of dumbed down and sort of flatlined to fit this you know frequency of you know corporate allowance essentially and um yeah it just sort of dulls and squashes everything and definitionally filters out anything that sort of corporations are going to disagree with yeah, I mean, it's just another f- sort of platform for advertising now. I mean, it's it's always been like yeah. that to an extent, but the intensification is, has just become extreme yeah. in, in the last 15, 20 years. I mean, papers like The Mirror and The Guardian used to be have really good investigative journalists, but they can't really afford them anymore. Like, mm. they're still running a, a major loss, but the loss is so heavy that they've had to cut back on all the interesting stuff that they did. Yeah, they don't really do news anymore, right? Like like you said, I mean, the death of investigative journalism is huge. Like, even in all these large companies like the BBC, whatever, they've, like, stripped investigative journalism out. And instead of them doing the news now, they, they're essentially just, like, 
news actors you know that they, they essentially CIA protagonists. i mean yeah basically they don't actually do news anymore no. in the sense of like investigative journalism you know like going to these companies and seeing what's up and sort of muckraking mm. and all that it isn't that anymore right it's essentially just pr for corporations at this point right they're news actors mm. yeah they get press releases from corporations right. and just tweak them a bit from what i can tell yeah they're stenographers to power yeah 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 and again, it's all about streamlining output to maximize profit because, or at least to minimize losses, making the output as efficient as possible. I mean, 24 7 news on the telly is the worst of the worst. You know, it's just this loop yeah. of sort of what to be scared of news summaries. And it's not really hard hitting stuff most of the time. Yeah, God, a very, very interesting perspective, actually, and we could actually talk about this all day long because, I mean, it's, it's, it's how they Gone rule. Gone off a bit of a tangent already. <laughs> it, it's how they rule, though, it's like through, you know, PR. <laughs> like, that's how capital, capitalism got to a point where it needs PR and the corporations mm. fill in the role as PR for capitalism, and then the corporations need their own PR people. It shapes ideology and consciousness, and, you know, it's, we're fighting against this very phenomenal the whole time. Yeah, God. And it's really strange as well, because people talk about clickbait like it's like a like a recent or a new invention. But like before the internet or the rise of like, you know, YouTube videos or whatever, there was print media that wanted attention and wanted to sell papers and, yeah. and get your eyeballs and everything, right? So, you know, people do like to talk about clickbait, like it's this new thing never seen before. But I mean, it's just it's just the, the, the modern take on at, at getting people's attention, which every, you know, news, quote unquote, corporation is trying to do. Yeah, and the, 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 I think the really new thing is social media now. I mean, this story in the last couple of weeks of with um, I can't, I didn't get a chance to really read it properly, but this story about um, Facebook controlling um, mm. which what news was put out on Facebook in Australia. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, it's sort of like the latest tug of war over information control. Um, and I think they came to a compromise in the end, but it's pretty, it's, it, that's quite a new thing where a giant social media company can, you know, stomp out a national newspaper or, or whatever in an entire country. I mean, that's quite a new thing. Not only that, but this time it's not like a bourgeois democratic company stomping out like a fucking Latin American news agency. It's actually mm. like first world democratic bourgeois government also doing that to another first world bourgeois democratic yeah, the, government th this is um the latest stage of capitalist competition or an example of that i mean rupert murdoch controls the media uh -huh. in australia or a large por a large portion of it and here honestly so this is zuckerberg taking on Murdoch to some degree. Wow. So that's very, you know, <laughs> the consequences of that, wow. we, we can't really know yet, but it's it's intensifying. That's interesting because Murdoch's got the physical newspapers and the TV channels, but, you know, uh, what's that mm. compared to Facebook? Mm. I mean, we touched on this a little bit last episode, right? Like, although, you know, uh, we like to talk a lot about class warfare between classes, right, in a sort of traditional sense, but there's also interclass warfare. Mm. Like, the bourgeoisie isn't a, a, a unified monolith, right? No. There are certain sections of them at war with certain other sections, and the same thing is true within each class, right? So, yeah, definitely what you're seeing here is the sort of old media in competition with the sort of n new technocracy, I suppose. Yeah. Mm, so, Ted, can I just ask you a personal one? What class would you say that you grew up in? Was your lumpen worker, middle class, petty bourgeois, and if it's a capitalist, you can get out now? But what was it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not a capitalist. <laughs> um, never have been. Um, I would say a sort of middling working class. Mm. Uh, like, not Labour aristocracy, but not poorest of the poor sort of thing um cool. somewhere in between cool. basically and there have been 
times where we've had it easier and times where where it's been harder sort of thing mm. um, like like with everyone i mean born into a very poor family that progressed through just sheer hard work and and um discipline to a, a bit more of a priv- privileged position that would i think i think that would sum it up basically mm, cool power to you comment so i mean the reason i ask is just to get more back behind the how did you get into actual politics i mean sitting around on leftist twitter did, yeah. did that just open your eyes to this whole other while people are perceiving the world differently and then you you start to realise these turn out to be historical materialists, scientific socialists. Yeah, I mean, basically before 9-11, I would say I wasn't really political at all, Mm -hmm. um, to be honest. Obviously, I was quite young then. And then the Iraq war, as a response to that, just seemed to be totally bizarre to me just totally disproportionate um as a response and that sort of woke me up to the fact that we're living in a world of of empire Mm. and then yeah the 2007-8 crash because it affected me a bit more personally in terms of career i was going for basically disintegrated i just felt like i'd become like a worker zombie sort of thing. I, I suppose that sounds a bit overstated, but it was. Just... Would you say that you thought that your work in the future would be more precarious? Yeah, it, it was definitely more precarious. I didn't really see any sort of career. It felt like I'd wasted my time in education, and I didn't really see where I was going. And I've I've not really had a consistent. I've not really had consistent work since then. It's been hard to to really. Um, really get anywhere to be honest i mean it's 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 like anything um with the way technology is going and the way it works under capitalism it's just difficult to get a foothold in right. industry i mean you, you see it so many students train for something quite specific at university or whatever and then uh-huh. get a job in the gig economy yeah. I, I work in the gig economy effectively as a freelancer and don't get anywhere near enough hours at the moment as what I thought I would be doing at that, at that time. So yeah, it just stemmed from there and being in an office job and not having that much to do. I mean, it was, if I'm honest, it was just silly. The amount of spare time me and other people in the office had, we would play silly games on the internet. And I mean, this is, you know, to talk about um, the low productivity of workers in Britain, especially at the moment over the last 10 years, this is why we've got so many office based jobs yeah. Where I don't really like to call them bullshit jobs like David Graeber does, but you can see <laughs> you can see Oh, I was just about to bring up that book as well. <laughs> I know if it was only yeah, every time. Yeah, you can see what he means because there's a lot of jobs where you're in an office eight hours a day and you may be working right. three or four and the rest of the time yeah. you don't know what to do. I used to have um mm. they used to time us as well. Like you'd have to set a timer um for how how long you were working. Um, yeah. But you'd you'd use it personally, so it didn't actually time what you were doing. But it, but at the end of the day, you were supposed to convert what was on the timer into a spreadsheet. Like what oh, have you God. been doing for eight hours? And on Friday on Fridays, I would be sitting there racking my brains, <laughs> thinking, "Well, how the hell can I make this look like I've done enough work to, to justify a wage?" Yeah. Fucking hell! It reminds me of when it was on job seekers allowance, and they'd be like, "Okay, you, have you done your forty hours per week?" And I was like, "Yeah, it mm. took me two oh, hours yeah. to travel to the fucking city centre there." And then I'm um, like thinking of all the shop names. Wow, that's crazy. And like I have flashbacks of a capitalist realism episode where we go into bureaucracy. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, and, and it's like, yeah. what was it, Ryan, where like the workers like end up doing the bureaucracy for themselves and it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's not even official. It's not even to serve a purpose. It's like bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. It was this case where um, it was almost exactly what you were talking about, actually, where, you know, workers at the end of the day had to log everything they were doing. But they were told by management that there would never be any consequences. Mm. Uh, based on what so essentially it was it was pointless there would be no repercussions if you didn't fill it in correctly or anything it was literally just 
bureaucracy for the point of bureaucracy, right? There was no consequences. There was no repercussions. It was never checked, mm. right? It was just this sort of ideological imposition on the workers, right? Ultimately as well, I think a lot of office jobs are literally for the sake of so one person can go out at the flashy car and the suit and then say, yeah, I've got an office in so-and-so place. I've got an office in so-and-so place. The business revolves around them and what they want to do. So, like, do it. yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many bullshit jobs that people do have. Yeah, that's why they call them self-licking ice cream cones, right? Because, like, bureaucratic positions exist to justify their own existence, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right? So, like, the, the bureaucratic layers within a government or a company, right, they exist, but they have to now justify their own existence. So they start producing bureaucracy to justify the bureaucracy, right? And it becomes this entire sort of, it, it just slows everything down. It drips everything in molasses, right? And it, again, it, it serves not only to impose an ideological position on the worker, but they're there to justify their own existence, right? Because no one at the end of the day wants to think, you know, my job is pointless, right? I don't do anything mm-hmm. here. So it's sort of like that, <laughs> you know, when you're a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, Right. They go out into the company saying, right, I need to insert bureaucracy. I need to do something here. I need to look like, you know, I need to justify my existence to my boss who's saying, what have you done this month, week or whatever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All, all of this does serve a point with, with the episode, though. So we'll go on to more towards your book now. It's so f- interesting, so fascinating and so humbling to like hear your personal life experience from your background, which differs so much from some of the other guests that we've had on the show. But obviously we're all in this making history together. I mean, we're all alive on the planet Earth now together making history. So I think that everybody should be proud, really genuinely proud of themselves and really proud of where the movement is going. I do see your book as a reflection towards the the culture and the class consciousness that we are producing and the comrades who have been organising over the last 10 years or so have been producing this culture this class consciousness to get to a point where somebody you know like yourself like your background i mean you're not you never grew up like on the street toys looking over your shoulder like from from like police going to arrest you for you know doing all kinds of illegal madness mm. this is where all those communists should be extremely proud of the work that you have done it has got you to a point where you can break out i mean Round of applause to left Twitter, everybody. Fucking hell, you've only gone and radicalised Ted Reese. Do you know what I'm saying? This is one of the things that I'm saying is we get people from all different classes, from different backgrounds, and get them to the point where they're saying literally capitalism's goddamn extinction, and socialism is the only solution here. So let's just go into the way that you produced from this class consciousness and this culture from socialism in the UK and and, and in the imperial core actually fucking reaching people's goddamn hearts and souls. You produced a great work. I'm going to call it a great work. It's something that only comes along so often when there's so much progress being made. It's literally a great project in any like UK circle. Any communist org that undoubtedly heard of socialism or extinction, climate, automation and war and the final capitalist breakdown, they're very likely probably got it on the table after one of the sessions, after an educational, after a, an event for people to buy because it's, you know, that renowned. Extremely well done, very deep, analytic, statistical, but also easy to understand for everybody really so i mean that was a bit of a whirlwind introduction there but i do really think that we should be proud of what the movement has achieved and a a book like yours is genuinely a massive like it's something that like communists and communism as, as a culture as a movement has produced through your goddamn fingertips that's a great way of putting it. Um, thanks so much for the kind words. Yeah, I, I thought I'd touch on my background because uh, on what led me up to this because I just sort of felt that the book was 
what I could contribute most to the movement in terms of my background in writing and specifically sort of writing summaries of things um, for one of a better <laughs> phrase. Um, because yeah, I, I, the, the thing is when you're coming into communism, people will give you a list of books to read and it's really overwhelming. Like, Capital for a start is obviously a, an incredibly overwhelming book to get into, but yeah. but but generally, um, we're also at a point where I th- where I think like the crisis is becoming so extreme that there could be like the movement could potentially explode uh, at any point in the near future, and when that happens, there's going to be so many new people like politicized who don't have a lot of experience in politics are just sort of reacting to what's happening in the world and i thought basically we needed a book like this that summarized as much as possible into sort of one accessible book to try and like help people just grasp as much as possible as you know as as soon as possible um so i can't i can't really claim that it's the ideal primer you want to read shorter things um like some of engel's work as as a good primer in the communist manifesto but once you get like a basic grasp of of marxist theory i think it's like almost like a secondary primer um but but also basing it on the current crisis in terms of the economic crisis and the, the climate crisis, um, there were a couple of other things I wanted to do with it, which was to to really recover a, a Marxist um, analysis of automation. Um, that, so that's why that's in the title as well. I think that's a really crucial component in understanding where the system's going. Um, and that's where it really did start. It started off as a as an essay on automation in terms of its impact on the law of value, because once you grasp the the basic Marxist theory that exploited commodity producing labor is the source of profit and exchange value, it doesn't take much to realize, well, if we're heading towards fully automated production, which we are, then the source of profit is diminishing and is disappearing. Um, so I, I started off writing an essay on that, which was like, it started off as a 3,000 word essay, then a 6,000 word essay. And then I just kept buying books on automation and reading them and doing more and more research. And before I knew it, I was writing a book. So it was, it was, it was kind of written by accident, really. Um, and, and by the time I'd done all that research on the automation, I thought, well, some of it touched on like energy production, a lot of of energy production is automated and i think automation actually has a a big role to play in saving the the habitability of the planet so once i'd done that i thought well if i just add a section or two on the climate crisis and um and then add more on the economic crisis it would it would work out as a, a, a summary of the whole historical situation that we find ourselves in but but just adding on what you said, it is a it is a summary of everything I've learned from other people, you know, on left Twitter in communist organisations I've been involved with in, in other activist organisations I've been involved with that and the research I've done. It's it's a culmination um, and a summary of all of of all of that. Well, yeah, dead interesting. We'll go we'll talk about it a bit more, but like just some contrast. Why we appreciate you coming on the podcast like this is because as you were searching for the word for the historical situation that we find ourselves in i'd already found one and in my mind i was just gonna say shit show and then you come <laughs> out with something so, so so nice and civil and, and a lot more descriptive <laughs> well no i could i completely agree <laughs> that's what we yeah. like on this podcast is is all different backgrounds different classes getting together and struggling with these things that we were all, all, all confronted by. For like people like Ryan out there who don't know like the law of value, could we talk a little bit about automation a bit more? Because it's just really super interesting yeah. how capitalism is building 
machinery to make capitalism more efficient, but it's this efficiencies that's going to also bring about capitalism's own destruction. And obviously, how you could put that is just a million ways better than I yeah, can. Yeah, I mean, that sums it up quite nicely, but I'll try and work in the law of value and the automation thing um, together. I mean, the, the source of, of exchange value and profit is surplus value, which comes from exploited commodity producing labor. So the the worker will work eight hours a day, for example, but in reality, the wage only covers something like four hours of that, for example, or less, and it works back down towards zero actually as time progresses. So if we split the day into necessary labor time, that four hours that you, you keep, is what you need to survive and the other four hours is appropriated by the capitalist that value is realized through the sale of commodities because capital has to keep expanding because it's always losing value like a fixed capital loses value when new better fixed capital comes along for example so to offset that devaluation which also affects currency and all the rest of it the system has to keep expanding. Um, you can put it another way, like a profit-based system by definition needs to keep expanding because if you run a company, you need to make more profit to attract even the same level of investment you did the year before. So the system has to expand and that means the worker and the working class has to be exploited more increasingly as time goes on to keep expanding capital. Um, so on one hand, it, the system needs to keep exploiting more workers, but on, on the other hand, it also needs to raise productivity because the quicker it's producing commodities and selling them, the quicker it's making a profit and accumulating profit and capital. And the way to do that is to innovate. And with each capitalist crisis, that will spur a new um, round of innovation because that's when prices are cheap or prices are low, sorry, of the materials that need to be bought. Um, also, labour power will become cheaper in that period, even just by dint of a few redundancies. You're, you're, even if you don't lower wages in the company, a few redundancies are replaced by machinery or, or computing power um, will reduce the absolute wage so over the last 200 years we've seen mechanization sort of evolve into semi-automation and now we've really see we've really seen a structural change now where automation really is the name of the game now um and more and more workers are just gonna i mean in the past we've had a situation where workers get replaced by semi-automated machinery and end up accepting lower wages in services or, or something. But now we're we're entering a period, I think, where automation is just going to be replacing most workers altogether because we're seeing it happening not just in manufacturing now, but in services as well. We're seeing we're seeing workers replaced. I think in Britain, supermarket checkout workers have have declined absolutely by about a quarter in the last decade. So that's an example of that. Yo, Shippy Smalls here, just with the producer's note. Since this was actually recorded, no bullshit, my store lost about half of the tills and have been replaced with these self-service tills, which, you know, you scan things yourself and you also have a camera pointed directly in your face with a screen showing you your own face back to you, just showing this increase in surveillance state that comes with this technology. But now back to Ted's very astute analysis on this. That the core, the core problem is capitalism needs to exploit more workers for more of the time. But at the same time, because it needs to raise productivity, it's fine. It's and because techno technology is in the position that it is now, and coupled with the fact that the the capitalist economy is now so big that it's so uh -huh. difficult to expand yet further that uh -huh. they have no choice but to to like accelerate the march towards full fully automated production. 
Right. And that's also how imperialism came about, right? Because like you said, capitalism requires two things consistently. It's either new markets to expand into or greater exploitation of existing markets. Yeah. And once capital has sort of established a firm foothold domestically, the next thing it does is look internationally, right? It looks abroad. It looks for resources. It looks for new markets. And, um, you know, traditionally, if you just look at the history of, you know, let's just take the United States from World War II to today, you know, the United States has been, you know, the greatest force for evil on the planet simply because it's the most imperialist nation, right? It's the nation that looks to other countries and um, attempts to spread its own capital there as as vigorously and viciously and as quickly as possible ultimately and that's why you get you know people like elon musk on twitter saying you know we'll coup whoever we want when talking about you know the coup that the united states orchestrated in bolivia last year over the um, vast amounts of lithium that Bolivia has. And why would Elon Musk be interested in lithium? Well, this is because the electric cars that Elon Musk produces uh, require vast amounts of lithium to produce. So, yeah. And again, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but this is why um, the Green New Deal and Social Democrats um, intersects with imperialism quite nicely, right? Because if the Green New Deal happened, um, and it happened exactly the way you know people like AOC want it to, it would require greater exploitation of um, the global South, places like Bolivia, in order to mine that lithium, in order to achieve their you know quote unquote uh, environmental you know dream. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it. it... If you go back to before the onset of imperialism, the imperialist countries were mainly reliant on slavery in their col colonies um, and exploiting their own working classes um, in a capitalistic way. Um, but they came up against the, the limits of their own population, so they then had to start exporting capital more and more um, and investing overseas more and more and so on and so forth and until it became a, 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 like a not just a continual phenomenon but a constant phenomenon definitely thank you for that both of you just want to bounce something off you once you get to a stage where you can actually compete with all of the other automation going on in that society. I think that you get to a point where like, you're not even capitalist. You're just part of the monopoly. Like if you think of it now, I mean, what makes like the key work in retail supermarkets, like as the Tesco's Marks and Spencer's, what makes them key workers and be able to like have their doors open um through covid is the fact like where like middle class families and businesses can't keep the, their doors open is because these big massive monopoly giants have got like they've got supply chains from from you know wagons going from one end of the country to another and they've got them on a contract and it's been going like that for ages they've got all the capital from all the cages where all the produce is being transported in They've got all the goddamn capital from all the machines that literally take the the cages off the wagon and then put them into the back. I mean, like we're we're looking at is like like literally these industries which are just like just monopolies and they're never ever gonna. I mean, I don't know. I I just I just look at COVID and then. A look at like no, I got you. you yeah, you're on it for sure. Well, well, yeah, because look, this is how it happened. Like anyone who's read Lenin knows that you know uh, uh, the nature of capital is to accumulate in fewer and fewer hands, right? And one of the mechanisms this works by is technological advancement, right? Because just like you said earlier, say you've got you know how a, an industry of whatever, and one company there's the technological advancement of like what you said earlier, with like a, a faster conveyor belt. So if the one company can afford the faster conveyor belt, right, they're the largest company because they can afford the, the latest and greatest in technology, right? And now you have a market where this one company has a technological advantage and the others don't, so they can't compete. So that company that was already ahead gets further ahead, right, through the use of ever-increasing uh, technology. And this is how, you know, capital accumulates into fewer and fewer hands because they already had... Uh, a, a capital advantage on their opposition, 
they used that capital to uh, invest in the latest and greatest technology, which gave them an even greater advantage, further restricting the number of hands that capital finds itself in, right? This is how you get, this is what monopoly, monopoly capitalism is. It's just technology is one way that, one mechanism in which that, that process happens. Def, oh God, fucking, I don't know, I just need to goddamn develop my thoughts rather than just goddamn chat shit in the future. But I'll edit all this out so it sounds nice. No, you were right, because even when you spoke about COVID, right, like, this is, COVID is also going to accelerate capital into fewer and fewer hands, right? Like, if you look at America... You know what I was thinking, I think I was driving at, was because it's only the larger monopolies, like... The, the CEOs and shareholders of these companies who like are going to keep profiting over COVID and, and then like have these retail roles. I think that maybe that's going to play a part in the class consciousness of, of like the middle class people or even like petty bourgeois to realize that in fact, you know what, they're not actually petty bourgeois as they thought they was. And they're actually not that much better off with the worker in terms of like, if they can ever become a successful business person. But I think like when it comes down to it, as COVID proves, um, you, you can't unless you literally already yeah. rule in class like monopoly. And- yes. Yeah, because COVID is the battlefield that class warfare is being waged on. It's just people don't really understand it because people aren't really all that class conscious, right? When we talk about class war, people normally talk about class war between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, right? But the, the, the class war that's taking place under COVID is between well, most, like almost all classes, really. But the one that's really interesting is the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie, right? Because all of these giant monopolies, right? Like Amazon is allowed to stay open no matter what, right? Like all its warehouses are still open, people are still there. But the sort of uh, mom and pop shops, right, have have to close down. Mm. And uh, mom and pop shops that, you know, don't sell food, that sell sort of, you know, commodity goods or whatever, right? They have to close down. And again, this is going to further facilitate the capital into fewer and fewer hands because once those shops close down who's going to buy them up right the bourgeoisie are going to buy the buy them up right the, the big bourgeoisie mm. um so you know this is essentially the bourgeoisie kicking an entire class of people uh, the petty bourgeois down into the proles again right because they want that property it's the same thing that's happening in america right now people are always asking like because in America, it's way worse than it is here in terms of like the government response, right? They've basically done absolutely nothing. They've got like, they got like one check or whatever months ago. And then other than that, they've done nothing. And people were asking, wait, why is our government so much worse than like every other country on the face of the earth here, right? And it's because America is so much more facilitated to capital. They're essentially letting all of those businesses and all of those companies die on the vine so that the 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 true bourgeoisie can come in and buy it all up at discounted rates, right? They don't want people to be able to pay their rent because their landlord, when they default, the big bourgeoisie yeah. will come in and buy up that property. They'll buy up that, you know? So it's, it's and again, it's another consolidation of capital, but it's a, a consolidation in a way that the bourgeoisie are actually coming for the petty bourgeois this time. And if they were truly class conscious, they would actually understand that this is class war, but it's now class war that's being war- waged against them when under sort of normal times, the bourgeois and petty bourgeois see themselves as more allies in the class war against the proletariat. But in this specific instance, it's the bourgeois coming for the petty bourgeois. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, comrade. Yeah, it, Thank you. It's not even just mo- the mom and pop shops. It's, you know... Debenhams, right? Yeah, you know, uh, absolutely, quite, definitely. Quite, um, not not massive um, corporations, but you know, not you, you you're seeing corporations going bust as well. Just just not right. the biggest ones. Yeah, absolutely correct, Amongo. Shall I talk about um, the, sort of the breakdown of capitalism during the development of automation a bit? Go for it. I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I'll ask you. So could you talk a little bit about <laughs> could you talk a little bit about the breakdown of capitalism among all of this technological development? Yeah, so as I sort of alluded to when I talked about why I was writing this in the first place, um, ultimately a fully automated system of production cannot be capitalist by definition because it would eliminate its source of profit 
um, which is the exploitation of commodity producing labor. Um, but it's not going to be a smooth process. Um, we're not just going to sort of seamlessly develop into a fully um, automated system and then have socialism. The, sy- the capitalist system is going to break down almost completely before that because the problem it has is that there's a dwindling supply of commodity producing labor to exploit and that's going up against an ever increasing size of total capital you've got capital on the one hand getting bigger and bigger and it's um, sort of number one fuel supply dwindling and shrinking so before that sort of comes to its ultimate conclusion that is obviously going to break down and i think we're entering potentially we're entering that that now over the next 10 20 years because i mean what you were touching on it there as well the other the other thing we've got um now is um the private sector and big capital in, in particular becoming increasingly dependent on the state so one of the the things we've seen at the moment is almost a sort of semi privatization of of even public education where these um, big pharma and big tech companies need the education system to be almost become like their number one customer so they want online subscription educational services almost like a rent-based education system but also where um, education does remain public they want the schools buying obviously the technology off of um, the big tech companies more and more so you see the big tech companies sort of dictating education more and more that's a similar phenomenon to what we've we've had a long time with the nhs which hasn't really been a nationalized system ever because in terms of it has to it's always had to buy its equipment and its medicine mostly from the private sector and again with the weapons industry like that is just a totally leeching off the state it's the state that does most of the innovating and then these private warmongers sell their weapons to the state that the state actually produced um it's just a totally parasitic relationship but that is becoming so parasitic now and so much more rent based now because that sort of dwindling supply of commodity producing labor where basically the deindustrialization which is the sort of moving away from manufacturing jobs to servicing uh, services jobs that's basically happened everywhere now all over the world even in yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, um, and uh, sort of a, it's happened there sort of much earlier than it it was beginning to happen relative to their development um, in China. So we see now, like services workers do produce surplus labour, um, sur- uh, surplus value, but they only tend to handle finished or near finished commodities. So um, a transport worker who's transporting commodities, technically that is part of the production process. So that his or her time has been exploited. The degree of exploitation or the degree of surplus value they're producing is perhaps um, not as much as you know the factory worker who's doing the bulk of the manufacturing of a product. So yeah, we, we're getting to this situation now where economically it's looking very dodgy because, as I say, you have the state becoming more and more dependent, sorry, the capital becoming more and more dependent on the state, i.e. the public, um, in a sort of very parasitic way. But the state is becoming more and more dependent on the central banks in their respective countries to fund this dependence. And so you're seeing this extreme devaluation of currency going on, which is only a reflection of the devaluation of of capital as a result of the efficiency gains being made in production via automation. And yeah, I I think there's there's a high potential for hyperinflation possibly in the next decade because we're seeing like the I think the US this year. I think it's something like 20% of all the dollars that have ever been printed happened in the last year. Mm-hmm. And obviously COVID's played a role in that. 
But if you look, this is just an intensification of a trend that was also had also sort of gone into overdrive in the previous 10, 15 years as well. Yeah, it's also the strange thing with like the financialization of everything. Like I was reading this article about like, you know, the real the the real reason behind the push towards cashless societies. And it's this thing now that even, you know, sort of all these imperial nations, it used to be, you know, sort of like outright colonialism where they would send troops to your, you know, doorstep. And sometimes that still happens. But the main way it tends to happen now is through like fiscal and financial policy that they wield as weapons over countries. Yeah. And they can't do that if your con- if your country is cash based. Right. So what they do is they they unleash this campaign to push for like a cashless society so that everything can be financialized so that you're dependent on you know the sort of global financial system yeah and the other side of that is they need to convert cash production of capital needs to become ever more efficient so electrons are more efficient than, than physical cash you can right. move it quicker but on, on through online systems but also they need to convert cash into stocks to to reduce the interest rate moving towards a cashless society that's another reason they need to induce the, the conversion of cash into stocks and obviously they they do that with incentives using the interest rates but now the interest rates are so low that it's becoming harder and harder to sort of incentivize that um, and there's a lot of talk about um, them doing things like banning high denomination cash so you won't be able to use 50 50 I don't know I don't know what's going to happen here but certainly in America that the government has been looking into banning high denomination cash and then putting a tax on small denominations of cash and they would do that via potentially via like adding a like a metallic strip to the money so that it could basically essentially be taxed when you take out the bank and that's going to make people poorer that's that's going to that's going to come up against real like cross class resistance yeah. if they actually decide to go ahead with that but the problem as ever is that if that doesn't happen, the banks will collapse sooner um, because they need they need that cash. They need to centralise more capital than before to keep surviving. There's also talk of, of a wealth tax. They're sort of talking about bail-ins as well rather than bailouts because bailouts are too politically toxic now <laughs> for the banks. So mm-hmm. they'd have to if the banks crash again, they will have to bail themselves in, which would involve essentially seizing assets from their own customers because the your bank the money that you or anyone else has in the bank is not yours, it's theirs. I mean they owe it to you. So right. it's a form of debt as far as far as they're concerned. But if mm-hmm. if they decide to seize it, there's not much you can do about it and unless you want to make a revolution. Right. And that's why they always want to prevent a rod on the banks right because only because of how over leveraged the banks are they only ever keep like five percent of their assets in cash right this is what everyone was so worried about in the in during the 2008 thing and this is in the end the reason even though it, it it couldn't have happened it was the reason that obama gave for bailing out the banks was that he said he didn't want a run on the banks right because if everyone panics mm. that the financial system is crashing everyone is going to run to the bank and take out everything they've got in there but the problem yeah. is that the banks are so over leveraged that they don't have that money right they only have like 5% of their balance book in cash so if everyone runs and tries to take out everything they can only five percent of the people that turn up are actually getting their money right and at that point the whole thing is is just kaput right like the whole system just falls over at that point it becomes not just you know a a, a crash of uh, the sort of financial uh financialization of services right like the speculation and the shell games on the shell games it becomes an actual oh you've taken my money right like yeah. it isn't anywhere now like it was there and now it's not right so yeah so again it's like an intensification of what's gone before but it's becoming extreme because of how difficult it's becoming to to eat to expand the capitalist system. And it goes back, it links back to what you were saying about the war on the petty bourgeoisie now. Like the banks are going to have to seize assets from people who actually have them. <laughs> and that's not that's not most of the working class. Right. So you're going to see yeah. a big... And they love it. Mm, 
I mean, what what you say is true, but they'll also like try and let one or two of the of the of the banks go, so that the bigger banks or the biggest banks can buy up their stuff on the cheap again. That sort of right, yeah, just they, like Lehman Brothers. Yeah, right? they they actually decided to let Le- Lehman Brothers um, go in the end because they needed one of them to go so that the other banks could suck up their property. Right, need a full guy. Yeah, yeah, basically. Um, and was it Bear Stearns was bought up by JP for something like 20 million or something when it was worth like 3 billion or something? It was ridiculous. And it, and it will also right. with a big um, subsidy from the, from the public as well. It's just, it's just out, and those two outright I- corruption, really. Yeah, definitely. And those two things are, are, are linked, right? Like because capitalism has to permanently, you know, evolve into new markets and they want to stave off a um, a financial collapse for as long as possible. Like yeah. them accumulating all of those companies that go out of business does stave off the crash for, yeah. I, I don't know how long, I'm not going to put a time yeah, saves, stamp on it, yeah. right? But It staves off the ultimate crash, yeah. Right, yeah. Lloyd's Bank planned to become a private landlord recently. Lloyd's, of course, it was after the 2008 crash where they broke from TSB. It used to be Lloyd's TSB. So what are we seeing here? There's a breakdown from Lloyd's going from Lloyd's TSB to Lloyd's and then Lloyd's, a bank, becoming a private landlord. Is that in response to what we're talking about here where the banks are going to have to try and grab all the property and capital that they can while they can? Yeah, but but basically we're heading now like we've Britain's been stuck at basically zero base rate interest for like yeah. more than a decade now. Before 2010, the US and British base interest rates had never gone below not much below 2% and they've both pretty much been stuck at zero. I mean the the US did have a few years where it crept back up towards 3% for the couple of years before COVID. But apart from that, they've both basically been stuck at zero now for over a decade. Mm. And they're now at a point where do they head, start heading into negative interest rates? Because it usually takes a 5% cut in the interest rate to end a recession. Um, so before the 2008 crisis, uh, interest rates were riding around 5.5%. And they went down to 0.5%. And I, I think the average since the 50s has been yeah. about 6% um, cut in interest rates. But they're already at zero. Um, they, it was cut mm-hmm. from 1.75% in the US down to zero after the, the COVID stock crash and from 0.75% to zero in Britain. And these are the two leading imperialist yeah. powers still. Germany and Italy and Japan all went into deep negative rates during World War II or, or around that period. But Britain and, and the US have never gone into negative base rates. So now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place where um, they would usually cut, they would usually need to cut the interest rate by at least another three or 4% to end the recession that hasn't really even started to get going yet, despite what we've already been through. Um, so I don't know what they're going to do. Um, I think that they're, in the end they're going to have to have to go deeper into negative interest rates because, and like bef- before they spent a decade on zero rates, anyone would have thought that would have been mad, like that that, that would never have happened. And people will still say, no, they won't go deep into in- negative interest rates. But we just had a decade of zero rates when no one thought that would happen. So the potential is there. Having said that, the new Fed chairman, I forget his name, has said that they that they're very reluctant to cut the rates further, and that they can't play the usual role in in that they would usually play in sort of sorting out the economy during a recession. So it's going to be incredibly uncertain what they do but when right. some of the more systematically important banks start to come under threat then they'll have to make a decision i think that they'll start going at least a percent or two into negative rates because i just don't think they'll have any other chance uh, other of choice but the, that solution can't last forever 
because you could, there's only so right. much cash you can convert into stocks. And at some point that would be impossible to incentivize as well, because if you're buying up government debt, you would, you would usually do that in return for uh, a surplus. You would get more back than you originally gave to the government. But with negative rates, you're now giving the government more than you're getting back. And before this, that, that had never happened before in Britain or the US, that, that had never happened. So that, I think, points out just how extreme this crisis is. And like compared to before the Great Depression, the debt is so much higher now. It's Before the Great Depression, debt to GDP was about 16%. And now we're already beyond 100%. And that's just the official debt. Right, we do have a, a, a debt-based economy. Like the entire system is propped up by debt, right? Like mm. there's more debt than there is money by uh, or orders and orders of yeah. magnitude. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, if everything, if they, tr if everyone tried to call back the debt, into it, the whole thing would just blow up, right? Like the entire system. And that actually is why so many economists, you know, fear the next crash because, like you said, you know, their go-to response is to slash interest rates. But if it, if it's at zero. Right, you're now you're now faced with. Uh, uh, I don't. I have no idea what they're going to do. I doubt they even know what they're going to do ultimately until it actually happens, and then their their hand will be forced. Yeah. I imagine to just do something. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it gets into a negative interest rate, that would be ridiculous because that 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 means at that point that they are paying you to take out loans, right? So like when you get when you take out a loan, you get an interest rate. It's like five percent. You have to pay back your loan plus the five percent, but in, in a negative interest rate, that means they're paying you to take out a loan. I mean, that's insane. That 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 is just going yeah. to further increase the supply of money, further increase liquidity. You know, before when you said you know twenty percent of all the dollars that have ever been produced have been produced. I forget what the time frame was. This de this decade or something. Right. That that will put this year. This year. Okay. Wow. Even worse. Twenty percent this year of all dollars ever printed this year. Right. And if they go into negative interest rates, that will put that on hyper steroids to the power of a thousand right like that's because if the government pays you or the banks whatever the fed pays you to take out loans everyone will be doing that everyone right yeah, yeah. it's just so un it's just unsustainable like eventually it's eventually it's going to come up against an absolute limit definitely and everything will collapse even the biggest companies and industries because money will basically become worthless and that's why in the end, socialism becomes an economic necessity. And yeah, I'm going to risk being accused of, an, uh, of being an economic determinist. But that will, All right. that will be the impetus for, uh, for, a, for a working class movement that will have no choice but to try and change the system. Let's move on to a similar question or a similar topic. And this is something I do think people really would like us to hear. <laughs> But I guess I'll just start off with just a bold question. Like, what do you think of accelerationism? Because, I mean, we're all talking here from the imperial core. Yeah, whilst there is countless people lumping poles in prison, sleeping on the streets, living dangerous, violent lives as the criminal element. And, you know... There are like other progressives out there reading theory, reading all of these fucking nine, twelve, thirteen Lenin books and Stalin books re repeatedly ongoing forever, preaching to these people who are poor as heck um, that the that the material conditions aren't right from the warm, safe, decorated homes. These socialists who've or should we continue to do as we have been practicing whilst waiting for the material conditions to get so bad that the rest of us start waking up, so to speak? Or, like, should we really be doing more, like, <laughs> more than reading, uh, more than the shambolic organizational state that the left is in now you know particularly because of covid like just the more we should be doing while everybody else is being butchered starved dying of thirst and disease in the global south or like are we doing the right thing up here in in the northern hemisphere so like the question is just about accelerationism and just like along those kind of perspectives that some people 
on the left or in communist circles? So uh, it depends what you mean by accelerationism, because that could mean demanding automation, for example, um, instead of demanding higher wages or, um, or it can mean like the, um, taking up the, the war of the war of offensive position or something like that. Is that what you, is that the latter? Is that what you mean? Yeah. I think it's coming from a more radical, we need a pro a pro a pro crack. <laughs> Protractinated people's war, or we need right. to absolutely start disabling and destroying uh, the mode of production where, where it stands. It's it's a really good question, and I I can't you know my my area of expertise is on the economic side rather than being a revolutionary leader or something, but um, it's it's a very it's just a very difficult question um i personally i think we're still in a period of protracted pro- propaganda um and just sort of base building um you know trying to convert people because because at the end of at the end of when everything's said and done we're we're very small our forces are very small at the moment we don't have the forces to go on the offensive um especially not in this country at the moment. So I think what we need to be doing is building solidarity. And we also need to be doing, having debates like about what we need to do and, and why, and, you know, we need to be having theoretical debates between anarchists and communists, for example, and, and drawing big audiences so that new forces can be sort of, and not, I don't want to use the word enlightened, but you know what I mean. They that they can make their decisions based on these sort of debates. Um, because from, you know, part of what I wrote in the book was about the necessity for for so called state socialism, right? So we we need a theory behind that and why. And I, I won't go into all that now, but the gist of it is the centralisation of capital creates monopoly capital, and the stage after that is an absolute monopoly, which. In, would indicate that the system needs a final merger into an, a sort of beca- and because that can't be privately owned, it needs to be publicly owned, and so on and so forth. So you get you end up with needing to nationalise the means of production in each country until you've internationalised them, um, and then after that, the state can begin to wither away. But looking back on what happened in the twentieth century, as much as I um, sympathise with what you're saying, I, I wish there were more. I wish our forces were bigger so that we could go on the offensive more. But until we have greater forces, we can't. And looking back on the the 20th century, things did have to get very, very bad before the working class were prepared to to start fighting back. And even then, the communist forces often remained in the minority because it was so hard. I I don't know exactly why, but it was just so hard to attract the forces towards the revolutionary end of the movement. So like, for example, in Germany, as much as I hate the SPD and what they did, their membership base was also always much larger than the Communist Party. So we have to sort of Mm -hmm. study that and and work out why. Um, And like, I I think that um, what happened in Russia was quite... It obviously turned out to be an an anomaly, right? You had the Bolsheviks where they only had 8,000 members only four months before the revolution. They sort of exploded as a party because of the exodus from the sort of more left-wing social democratic parties at the point where those parties' leaderships wanted to continue the war. Whereas in Germany, the Communist Party never had that option uh, to offer the the Soviets. The war had already ended, and so it became a lot more of a protracted struggle. Um, so th- there has to be a balance, right, between um, opposing tailism and economism and running too far ahead of the masses. Like you have to get the the balance right because if you if you you run too far ahead of where of where they are in both rhetoric and deed then you'll just isolate yourselves and potentially even like alienate too many people 
mm-hmm. with acceleration of demanding automation as well the same you get the same problem if that was to be if we were to have a party and we and we said our main um objective is to automate the means of production without some sort of backup plan for the people who would lose their jobs to automation those people are being proletarianized and lumpenized but they will blame you they would blame you potentially for that happening so you have to think all these things through it's like in germany when it was all kicking off um after 19 um 19 and you had the, the big mutinies you had a situation where the, the communists were in the total minority, like very, very small numbers, when the Sil- when the Soviets erupted and, and were built out of the mutiny. And Rosa Luxemburg wanted a sort of protracted struggle for reformist demands, whereas mm. uh, Liebknecht wanted to just go for it off the bat. His message to the Soviets that there was a counter-revolution underway because the S- SPD was in power in par- in a bourgeois parliament that was falling on deaf ears because the the consciousness just wasn't there um and it wasn't until the SPD started attacking the workers and the communists that consciousness consciousness really started to to rise somewhat um and then you had so you had the communist party growing steadily throughout this period when the SPD was betraying workers there was a point where the Communist Party merged with the left independent social democrats and out of nowhere suddenly you had a 500,000 strong communist party and that was out of the I think that was out of the kaputch um which which where the the right basically tried to seize power from the SPD um mm-hmm. and so suddenly you had a very big and strong communist party but it still wasn't really big enough um, to seize power and hold on to it, like in the way that the Bolsheviks did, and the Kaputch thing was defeated by a general strike, an armed general strike, which involved most of the SPD workers, um, and that's how um, the right was um, stopped from taking power. Um, but when that ended, um, the general strike ended, and the workers went back to work. <laughs> And at that time, the Communist Party, which was now as large as it had ever been, demanded that they immediately go into another general strike to seize power um, in a socialist, like in a properly socialist revolution. But because the workers had only just gone back to work and was still had sort of a mixed consciousness, it just fell on deaf ears. But the Communist Party was calling everyone that went back to work and didn't wasn't up for a, another general strike. You, you got to remember this is based. This is all out war at this point, and a lot of people's instinct is to oppose war because of the devastation it causes. So they wanted to. Most workers wanted to go back to work. And the the Communist Party was calling, basic, essentially they were calling most of the working class scabs for going back to work. And that totally backfired and its membership halved, or more than halved, I think it fell back down to 200,000. And it never really recovered after that. So this is the sort of lesson, I think, that we have to take on board. Um, it's very difficult because like you say, there's the bottom end of the working class is the one struggling the most and it's it's not really right that they should have to wait for the conditions to generate a bigger movement i mean by all means if you can find enough working class people at the moment to start going on the offensive and and to start like even if it's just like more militant protests or bigger strikes if you can find those people do it like you can't wait for the perfect conditions but finding those people at the moment is very difficult and so i i I just like based on the experiences of the past especially in countries with with right-wing governments it's not unusual that there isn't and there isn't much working class militancy if you look at look at the US during the Great Depression before Roosevelt came to power, there wasn't much working class militancy. But but when he did, that's when there was a lot more working class militancy. Because even though we know Roosevelt was out to save capitalism, 
he was far less likely to turn the the military on any striking workers. Mm. So and then I, and then I contrast this with Venezuela, right, where you've got a left where you had um, you had um, Chavez, who was a, a military man, mm-hmm. and he had lots of followers in the military. Um, so that gave the working class a lot more confidence to organize and to be militant and to make these demands. So this is where economics isn't the only thing um, in my analysis. It's, it's the real material situation as well. Um, and we saw in this country, like um, with Corbyn, it, he, he, did, he did have a massive um, following. When you look at his rallies, like we haven't really seen that for a long time. Like so many people turning out for 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 political rallies, even though they they were just static affairs with no real militancy. But were those people prepared to go further? Not at this moment in time. It's kind of a difficult thing to summarise, but I don't think you'll see a big movement erupt until we get mutinies. Basically, if I'm absolutely honest, because the left itself is quite small, not just the communist left, like the social democratic left is a lot bigger than the communist left, but it's still quite small. Uh-huh. Like it's the minority in the Democratic Party. Um, it's the minor- minority in the, in the Labour Party. And then outside of those parties, it's still quite small. Like the DSA in America is is relatively tiny compared to the population of the US. So yeah, I, d- I don't know what you think about that sort of analysis. I mean, it's it's don't get me wrong, I find it incredibly frustrate, frustrating. Mm. But I do think at the moment we need to concentrate on building solidarity between organisations and and people, uh, mutual aid, developing relationships. Trying to merge organisations is something I think we should be looking at where where it's possible. We have so many very small socialist and communist organisations and I think there needs to be emerging of these organizations so that we can start to have a like a more of a of a serious line struggle within within organizations yeah. because doing it in separate organizations is just you know it's a slower process and it's you know we don't have the time so i, I think we mm-hmm. we absolutely need to get serious but we need to we need to try and we need to try something new because like all this sort of sectarianism and separation is uh, i see it as an ob- obstacle i mean that's not that's not a, a mind-blowing statement obviously but it's some it's a very pressing thing uh that we need to sort of, sort of start trying to resolve for when these eruptions do take place because they are they are gonna they are gonna happen yeah defo thank you for that answer it was well thought out Gave me a lot to think about and our listeners too. It's something that so many of us are, you know, wrestling with as well. Mm. So let me just go through a couple of points and we've got to be done by five a year as well. So we're kind of wrapping up too. But you talked about tailism um, at one point and we can't just be engaging in tailism. Um, and also saying that it's not fair for, you know, the lump and the most oppressed having to wait until everybody else is ready to have a goddamn revolution or the conditions yeah. to be right for them. And you even said that, you know, we should wait until you find enough working class people who are willing to become more more militant. And, I mean, that just shows how naturally ingrained it is into, like, communist ideology that, like, the lumpen, the most oppressed, the most deprived, having to wait on the working class and understand mm-hmm. it from just a strategic, operational practice point, it makes perfect sense. But this is also something that I don't think is talked about very much as maybe like the lumpen, maybe the worker, and maybe like the academic, you know, student class, maybe they have different roles to play. Maybe the student's academic role would look something more like the tailism approach, it would look like, like the, the organising approach and they would be the ones who are going to have to be there for the people, you know, after the struggle has, has emerged and 
to give food to the people and to do all of this, you know, mutual aid work, which is so important, but it's not as important as it would be after we've toppled the goddamn state and we need to, like, protect each other through a transitional stage to not have a situation of what happened with, with, with Cuba. Special period. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that could be one of the roles for, like, students and organisers to literally be the rear guard and to ensure or to plan around the organization capacity so that, like, if revolution does happen tomorrow, then there's at least something in in the way of, of like, a kind of unique special period for this country. And I do think that it should be the Lumpen class who are out there being vanguard because they're part of the masses. They're the people. They're the most popular in their environment. You know, they speak to the people in ways that these students and workers don't because the workers are so alienated. I think it's a role for the workers to go to work, try and keep the jobs, try and make sure that there's progressive unions and to yeah. obviously support workers in that role and spread class consciousness in the workplace. I don't think that because of the because of the um like consumerism that's ingrained within workers today, then you're gonna find revolutionary potential there. You'll find a lot of reaction. But honestly I feel like when talking about working classes, like we're talking about a whole class of people, like millions of human beings who are literally must be exhausted like 80% of the work week. I mean, yeah. they're forcing themselves to go to sleep early. They've got to force themselves to wake up early. I could think that this is like a legitimately sleep-deprived grouping of human beings. Like, yeah. genuinely think that that's like not seriously considering enough that maybe there's a whole group of society that are just literally exhausted and need sleep <laughs> like yeah and even even the privileged layer um you know working very long hours especially now yeah and they, and they are being attacked as well you know the uh the f- fire and rehire is back you know and with a vengeance in this country yeah you know, workers are getting fired and rehired on a much lower wage. And that, that's the sort of thing that's happening. And so you can never really prejudge which layer is going to be the most radical. Um, it, it, can, it depends on all sorts of possibilities that will unfold as the crisis unfolds. But we're certainly, I certainly agree. I think, you know, I agree with, you know, the Lenin's adage that we need to dig deeper into the, the, the lower poorest part of the masses because they've got the the least to lose and the most to to gain Mm -hmm. when you're talking about in the end making a revolution in just one country you need a majority of the population a sizable majority because not only have you got to make the revolution you've then got to hold on to power and you've got to do all that in the face of counter-revolution whilst trying to make all the changes that need to be made you know it's going to be hellish to say the least when it does happen it, it's going to be really really challenging i think a lot of people just haven't experienced anything like what's going to happen all over the world whether, whether it's you know 10 years away 20 years away or, or, or whatever when it happens it's going to be like nothing we've we've ever really ever experienced and that's that is another reason to start sort of really thinking about what we need to do to prepare for that just mentally as much as anything mm. but yeah you the other problem you have in a revolution a, a socialist revolution is that you need expertise in certain areas you do need skilled workers of the upper layers to defect farming for example you you, you need to take farms with you because farming isn't something that, that some untrained workers can just pick up and carry on seamlessly um, if we're going to avoid yeah. famines, for example. You know, there's there's all sorts of things to consider in that, in that sense. We're not a warrior class. The majority of us are not, are not, we're not warriors. We're not trained soldiers. We don't have the expertise in all sorts of things that we would need to. So it's it's very difficult. My opinion is that the United Front tactic is the one, uh, especially like because there's two two United Front tactics. 
Uh, well, there's the united front from above and the and uh, below, from below. Uh, above, you address the um, the reformist leaders in calls for joint action in order to address the rank and file of those organisations in a bid to win them over. Um, and then the, below, you you don't address the reformist leaders. I think it needs to be from above to sort of avoid the pitfalls of sectarianism. And look, there's going to be sectarianism. It's inevitable. There's going to be fallouts and all sorts of things because we're trying we're trying to convert and convince millions and millions of people who who at the moment don't really understand what's going on to the full extent anyway. And that's a very difficult task. I mean, we talked a bit about the commodity fetish and the fact that at the moment, the irony is, or the contradiction is, that the commodity fetish, the closer we get to the end of capitalism, the stronger the commodity fetish um, gets. It's like what you're saying about consumerism. I mean, I think the problems with consumerism are sometimes overstated or, or sort of misdiagnosed. But it's like you said, the commodity fetish is stronger than ever because from everyone's point of view, no one really wants the, no one really wants the economy to collapse. We all wish that capitalism could provide what socialism could because if it could, everyone would be living good standard of living and we wouldn't need to risk our lives in a revolution. Mm. So from a lot of people's perspective, probably the majority at the moment, the number one concern is produce more commodities, sell more commodities, so that the economy's growing, so that it doesn't collapse, so that I've still got, you know, uh, running water in the morning. Mm. You know, that's the sort of thing that's going on. So it's ideologically stronger than ever, but it, there's also this sort of um, interaction with human nature going on, um, where you, you know who in their right mind really wants the economy to collapse because the poorest will be hit the worst, but everyone else will be hit very hard as well. But when all is said and done, that is eventually going to happen. The economy will grind to a complete halt. And in between that, you know, things are going to get worse and worse. And, you know, so it'll be a gradual process of building the movement, but then it, at some point it will, you know, explode. And that's, that's the essence of dialectics right there. <laughs> As Lenin said, to paraphrase him, there are decades when nothing happens and then days when decades happen. Mm. And that that's the essence of dialectic, really. So that's what we're working towards. So, yeah, it's a hell of a situation we're in, um, especially <laughs> when you take climate change into account. But, yeah, it, these are very difficult and challenging questions, and I think this, that's one of the reasons we need to really talk talk about them, like the really difficult questions and that's another thing i tried to fit into the book is like some of the, the really difficult questions in terms of the lo logistics of the transition you actually once you have seized power after that there will it will be a gradual process of nationalizing production like you can't just you're never going to be able to expropriate the whole of the bourgeoisie in in one go like by implementing a new law because you would just spark a furious civil war that would like destroy the country and cause famine. So you you have to be quite um, tactical even at that point. It's like in Russia, they couldn't really, they had to do land reform in, in favour of the peasants, which meant allowing private lots of land for peasants. They couldn't just nationalise all the land in one group. So for example, in the here and now, I think once we have power, we'll have to be very clever about the way we go about things in terms of um, expropriations. I think there will have to be compensation for expropriations where possible. There will need to be incentives for incentivized capitulation or to get people to cross over to the other side, as it were, especially with farmers. Like We will need to incentivize trained farmers to work with the revolution and that sort of thing. So if you want to transform society so that we we're living in a more communal way you'll need to incentivize that because everyone's used to living in a bourgeois style family with 2.4 children or whatever you yeah you'll need to incentivize that with rent reductions and tax breaks and that sort of thing so when you look into it and how it plays out and how it's played out in the past it's very very complicated and we will need a program that 
can attract and win over the majority of a population in a given country. And we won't be able to rapidly change the culture of a country like overnight. It will, it will take years and years and years of gradual progress after a revolution to really transform culture, for example. I don't think you can have a cultural revolution like that like really changes things as much as we'd like um, in a quick period, um, just as an example. Wow, Ted. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, because I really feel like we're only now starting to get to somewhere. And yeah, this is really what I'd like to think about, what I really love to with the people to be discussing about I'd love to see organisations join hands <laughs> and you know yeah. drop any kind of ego or you know machismoism or you know yeah. any kind of culture that they might have gotten and you know just drop it in favour of, of a united proletarian communist organisation that would be really cool to see and we'll continue to take those ideas with us. And yeah, just love to hear more of these discussions throughout like communist media propaganda. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it, wrap it up, unfortunately. We've got another guest who's going to be in this channel anytime soon, Rev Fightback. Thank you so much, Ed. Really enjoyed that. Really going to listen to it a good four or five times. And everybody's going to have to get your book. Both me and Ryan will get your book off you. Um, you've just come out with a hard copy, have you not? Or is that coming out soon? Uh, yeah, the paperback is now available, unfortunately, on Amazon only. Um, that's the only way I could um, do the a printed version and distribute it. Um, but I'm also going to release um, a PDF and an EPUB version. Um, that will just be available for free. And I'm also writing a book for Zero Books about Henrik Grossman, who we didn't get to talk about, but he was he was the 20th century Marxist economist who sort of outlines Marx's economic theory most sort of um, accurately in my eyes. So I think it's, he's important to understand in terms of understanding capitalist crisis. And that's where your Twitter handle comes from? Yeah, at Grossmanite, yeah. Um, Interesting. Uh, boss, yeah, so we'll get your book off you. Yeah. Can we get it signed off you? Yeah? Um, yeah, of course, if you want to. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had one rec one request for that, and when it happened, I was I was a bit shocked. I was like, really? <laughs> oh, no, uh, I mean, I, I get um, signed versions of all the guests that we have, and I'm going to have... Signed Caleb Morpin one's gonna have it from our beloved Miranda. We we'll get it from everybody. So that's cool, yeah. Yeah, and then when I die, all of them can go into the Liverpool City Museum. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice. So Bosh, I'd love to do this again sometime. Um once we've developed For something sure. more, maybe once we've actually read your book from start to finish. Yeah, sure. And then we can um, go over some of the themes of that. Yeah, great. I'd love to do that. And just thanks so much for having me on. A pleasure. Um, have you Pleasure's ours, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Have you got any final shout outs, any plugs that you want to get in that you haven't already mentioned? Then we can link them in the show notes for you. Trying to think. Oh, my blog as well is Grossmanite on Medium. Um, you can read some more sort of short stuff on there. Uh, I, also, I also work a bit with uh, Procult, um, who I think you spoke to recently. Yeah. So I'll just yeah. give a shout out to them. Check out their work because it's great. Um, it's uh -huh. the sort of thing we really need. Um, you know, a sort of media video format of con of propaganda. Um, Absolutely. To, to go with all these good books that are coming out as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're doing some good shit here, so hopefully people do support you by going away and getting your book. I've made that available in the in the links. So, right. With, with that said, we'll love you and leave you. Thank you again for your time. Solidarity, comrade. Keep up the flipping amazing work. If there's anything we can ever do for you anytime, do let us know. You got solidarity forever. And to everybody else, workers and lumpen of the world, 
Unite. There are some people. 